Good day, dear listeners. Uh, Steve Preda here with the Management Blueprint podcast. And my guest today is Derry Lyons, the co-founder and CEO of San Antonio, Texas-based Pax Financial Group, a business that is passionate about helping others live the life of their dreams. Derry, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, Steve. Appreciate it. So, Daryl, you have a really interesting story um, rising from a trailer park uh, to running a thriving financial advisory business. That's kind of a, an American dream kind of story. Can you tell me how you did that and how it, it actually helped you or, 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 I don't know, hampered you in your journey? Yeah, it's actually a good question. Um, both uh, exist. We had... Uh, there was a, in the 80s, um, there was a savings and loans crisis that took place and it hit the South Texas area, San Antonio area, just like it hit a lot of areas. Um, my parents were not immune to that. That's when we started to begin really our struggles financially. Uh, my mom had me when she was 16. My dad was 20. So um, they were just kids and, um, you know, not much education. So we had bounced around. Um, and, you know, lived in different houses and some, some were nicer than others. And then ended up uh, moving to Castroville, Texas, where we lived in a little trailer park on the side of the road. I remember edging the trailer. They've got skirting on the trailers. You got to edge it. Otherwise weeds grow up. And, but when you, you edge too close, it breaks the skirting. And I thought, you know, it'd be nice to have a house without a foundation. And, uh, I remember a, fa- a friend of mine, her dad was a banker and they had a real nice thick foundation. And I thought, well, I guess I could go into banking, but I didn't know any bankers. So um, my curiosity began there. And it really, the curiosity was about all things money. Um, mm-hmm. So I was just curious about anything that had to do with money. I think that was kind of the the really catalyst for, for driving my life, uh, not rooted in selfish ambition, but just a really interesting curiosity. There's two parts to your question. One, I haven't ever, I haven't been asked in a long time. And I think it's a good question. Like what, how did it might hurt, hurt me? I, you know, I, in reflection, there's good and bad people, both in like rich communities and poor communities. And since I've been around both, um, I feel pretty comfortable saying this, but there's some habits I think of um, communities that don't have money that I probably had to unwind. Um, I didn't trust a lot of people. Uh, I found that I didn't really, you know, if you were a professional, I always thought you were trying to take. And this, I I didn't realize that trust was a key element to making business and really our whole system work. But I was just, I didn't have that in me. I I didn't trust anybody with anything. I always thought they were out to get me or take from me. And I had to really work through that. And I didn't realize that even existed. So that was one of the challenges I had more than anything. Mm -hmm. So that second part of your question was a good one. What about, uh, I mean, maybe that's a weird question to ask, but is there a way that it actually helped you be successful that you uh, started from a humble humble beginnings? Yeah. I mean, I had nothing to lose. Um, I always, you know, I always thought it started to get real when I had a child and I thought, well, I remember I was, I had to put, you know, we were just starting the business. So I had to put um, my mortgage on a I had to do a cash advance to pay my mortgage and uh, so stupid, but I would, that's where I was at. And, and I, and I thought, well, I was starting a business. I had a passion to do that. And I thought, well, I, I could, I guess we could live in a trailer park. It's, I mean, it's doable. And so, you know, I guess the idea that I had nothing to lose, you know, in terms of pride, I didn't have to drive fancy cars. I didn't have to, I didn't have to, you know, have stuff. So that was very helpful. Um, and then the other thing is, I think that's helped me today as I've matured a little bit more over the years and still maturing in a lot of ways, but um, I, I empathize with people a lot, you know, I, when, when they're struggling, um, you know, I, I can, I know where they're at and sometimes it's self-inflicted and other times it's, it's kind of just a mindset people are in, you, you know, sometimes people are victims and sometimes people don't trust. And I see things maybe differently than, than most because I've been there and uh, that helps me a lot in life and in business. Yeah. I can imagine as a, as a financial advisor, you have to relate to people in, in ways that maybe uh, it's uncomfortable for them to share the information, but if, if someone can, they know that it's been there and, know what they are talking about or they are going through, then they can actually open up to that person. Um, I find in my coaching that uh, my biggest assets are my biggest failures. So when, 
you know, when I see someone uh, in a struggling situation, then I, I have been there and I can share how I felt and how I go through it. It really creates uh, uh, relatedness and, and then people, you know, trust me for, for being able to help them because they know what they are feeling. Yeah. So anyway, um, that is very, uh, very, um, uh, very interesting. So let's switch gears here and let's talk about a strategic planning process that you have been part of for a long time. And uh, you're part of a C12 or you've been part of a C12 group, which we have shot over 200 episodes here, but we haven't had anyone who had a C12 background. I was always wondering about yeah. you know, what these peer groups uh, uh, do and how do they operate. So, so can you tell a little bit about C12 to begin with, and then the strategic planning framework that C12 teaches its members. Yeah. Um, so I've been a member. It's kind of weird. I got a 10-year award for being a member for 10 years. I've actually been longer than that uh, because um, I had I kind of jumped into, at the time, one of our co-founders was in C12, but then he got sick. And so I just kind of um, like chronic illness. He's healthy today, but um, I jumped in to kind of take his place but my official membership was 10 years ago. Um, and so a lot of, you know, I, I wouldn't be in something that long if it didn't bring value. Uh, and then, but it, you know, it's just like everything else. Every four years, you're like, ah, should I be doing that? And you break through, you know, you kind of just push if when you grow up, you just push through those just kind of seasons. And then you, the, on the other side is just some pretty, pretty awesome stuff. So uh, this coaching program has held me accountable. Um, it's made me a better man. Uh, it really has. I've been around a lot of people that have pushed me and challenged me. And I think that goes, it's just like any, you know, executive coaching program like Vis Vistage and the others that are out there. Um, the difference here is that uh, this is all rooted in a, in a, in a biblical model. So um, we generally speaking, everybody's Christian walk is coming from a different place um, when somebody joins, the the main element to to the whole framework is to um, not be abrasive to that to that worldview, the Christian worldview. Um, but it's not asking somebody to adopt a specific, rigid, uh, legalistic type of worship or type of uh, lifestyle, but rather honoring the Christian worldview and then um, uh, being open to integrating some of that biblical worldview into your business model. And so there's. Um, there's a framework for how we do that. And, and that makes it uh, unique to the model is that biblical worldview. Um, I can discuss some of the elements of that, but I'll take a breath, see if you have any questions there. Okay. All right. So, so yeah, I mean, I'd be curious about how uh, the Christian worldview can help businesses. So what is it that you can implement uh, that uh, that is maybe different from, you know, from, from other peer groups, uh, the work of other peer groups, how do you approach things different? Yeah. So, you know, it's funny because when, you know, when you think about Christians in the historical sense, they weren't called Christians. They were called people of the way. That's what they were originally called. Um, a group of individuals who <clears throat> were generally Jewish, who, um, you know, were taught by this rabbi, and Jesus Christ and Christians obviously um, believe that he is God. Um, and so the idea that the people of the way had a different way of doing things is um, sometimes not really expressed that well. But you think about it, you know, Jesus, you know, talk, we talk about even turning the other cheek or it, it is better to give than receive. There's a lot of things that Jesus talked about that were completely opposite. And so what we're doing all the time is we're asking ourselves is, the cultural framework for business the right way, or have we gotten a place of moral relevancy, which it's the right way of doing that things as long as the culture accepts it. And so I think we kind of always test our way of life against this cultural relevancy that may exist versus what would Jesus have said about how we do things. Um, as an example, um, giving is probably a good one. Um, how do we give and what does the word of God tell us about giving even as business owners? Um, and we'll wrestle with that. And, you know, we know that 
in the word of God, it says, you know, God loves a, a generous giver, not who's reluctant or under compulsion is what the word mm -hmm. of God says. Mm -hmm. So, but we'll spend some time in a group format wrestling with that. Should we give from the business or should we give personally? Should we give gross? Should we give net? Um, what does that look like from a giving perspective? But that's an easy one. It actually gets a little bit more complex when you're talking about the um, the nuances of um, uh, compensating employees or even firing somebody. What is, how do we, how do we introduce a biblical framework? Cause the Bible doesn't talk about, Hey, in a corporate environment, if somebody, um, is misaligned with your culture, how do you fire them? You can't go to Genesis and try to look that up. You've got to try to understand maybe even through parables, um, mm -hmm. on how to best, um, execute something like that, but leave somebody still with a degree of dignity, um, and so it really gets nuanced. And I think that's why there is a curriculum that guides our dialogue, but it's really done in a function of a peer group where we, or it's facilitated by somebody who's generally rooted in some good biblical worldview and some great business acumen based on their experience to facilitate a dialogue between business owners who have a million dollars or more in revenue to wrestle with these concepts and come away with what we might think might be a, a Christian perspective on execution. Um, I think it makes a complete sense because as business people, we always have to strike a balance between being savvy business people and being uh, caring human beings. And essentially what you do is you, you draw on the Bible, I suppose, and, and you are uh, kind of informing yourself as to, okay, what is the right way here? What is the right balance to strike here? And and you have a conversation in the peer group. That's uh, I can definitely see that this is being very, very helpful um, to the people and, and the business itself. Um, because ultimately, um, I believe that the values of the business are projected outside to the customers. And if they feel that this is, a, this is an ethical and decent business that uh, has strong values and, and uh, aligned, then uh, it's going to help you in business as well. So that's that's awesome. So let's uh, let's talk a little bit about this strategic planning blueprint. So C12, I understand from our earlier discussion, uh, there is a strategic planning methodology that C12 uh, groups have developed, and uh, and you're using that methodology. So can you share about what that looks like? Sure. Yeah. Uh, the, the simplicity is, uh, I think, um, I think worthy of of addressing. You know, I. I think of like the word elegant is probably a good word to describe it because elegant, elegant kind of means to me like the collision of simplicity with a degree of academic rigor. And it's just mm -hmm. uh, delivered in such a way that, you know, it can be adopted uh, by many people. Sometimes it's not appreciated because of its simplicity. Um, but, you know, I think this does kind of fit that profile of elegant. And it's a it's called a five point alignment matrix. So uh, the idea is is that we want to adopt a strategy in each one of these areas. Um, the first one being, um, you know, revenue generation. Um, so that one often is easy for business owners because it's sales, and we all, I mean, business owners, we kind of that one's intuitive. But you know, we all know that there's substance behind that, and there's some st specific leading uh, indicators and KPIs that need to drive that. Um, so, but that would be one. So that would be one category um, in this alignment process. The other one would be generally cash flow related, which is something that can often be overlooked by business owners, as as you know. Um, and so we wrestle with that, and and. I, and you've seen this as well, Steve, over the years, I'm so surprised. And, and I think also, also a degree of comfort of how many business owners get to the top and really almost can't tie their shoe when it comes to cash flow mm -hmm. stuff. And so that we, we get into that cash flow um, and what it, what it looks like to have an emergency fund and then develop some key performance indicators around that too. The, the next one would be um, organization uh, development. So how do we, um, you know, intentionally develop our culture and our people and then um, bring on the right people in the right seats, so to speak. Uh, the next one would be operational management. Um, and that would include, you know, supply chain issues uh, and, and distribution issues and managing time, um, pr productivity, things like that. Um, a lot of uh, manufacturing businesses would deal with that. Um, being a service related business, I kind of, um, I kind of, you know, 
that one's a little bit more challenging, but it's but it's one that I've been able to develop a framework around as well. And the last one I think is is probably you, this would make sense to you. And this one's ministry work. How do we how do you effectively integrate some type of ministry into your business and develop um, performance indicators around that? Um, and that's a lot of fun. And I think when you when I've seen members first join C12, that one is just kind of like whew, I, I can't even they can't even get their head around that piece. Um, but after, you know, kind of being a part of the culture, a little bit of the culture kind of creates this, um, a good peer pressure to start thinking deeply about that. And then um, you start to see massive, massive giving done through these businesses um, at a, a level that's inspiring and um, to ministries, nonprofits, charities, um, people that are hurting. And if you can get businesses, obviously, to adopt that fifth piece in, in the ministry work, you do see some changes in communities happen. And so we're we're seeing some of that. That's uh, that's very interesting. So the ministry work is actual giving, or there are other ways of doing ministry work. Definitely other ways. I think every business has a different approach. Some of some of it serving. Um, you know, there's businesses that have slim margins and there's there's businesses that just don't have, you know, they've got shareholders and the shareholders that just aren't you know, necessarily online with, you know, they they say they raise their hand and say, hey, I'll do the giving personally. So um, mm -hmm. so, so you have to figure out how to creatively um, introduce some ministry. And uh, that's part of the peer group is to help you wrestle with that. And then um, what you find ultimately is by doing that, you're. Uh, culture then rallies behind that type of uh, environment and then indirectly customers and in your community sees that so it kind of rises all boats so to speak yeah that's that's it's awesome very interesting uh, i'm i'm glad that you shared a little bit uh, around these topics of how the uh, christian leaders think about leadership and definitely the the other four uh, legs i can recognize as uh, makes makes perfect sense. So let's switch gears here and let's talk a little bit about succession planning, you know, wealth management. So you help people, uh, you know, do good succession planning. What is the best practice that you have seen in this area of succession planning? How would you describe an ideal scenario? Yeah. So, so, I, you know, I've been a financial advisor for many years. I've been doing this since 99. Um, I've stepped out of that role and provide leadership to the organization now. And so we have 10 advisors and um, I was trying to take inventory of kind of the needs in the marketplace as, as I've kind of gotten away from the kneecap to kneecap um, financial advice conversations um, and really focused on, you know, as a business owner now, you know, strategy and, um, you know, finding the problems in the marketplaces and filling out, filling those problems. Well, one of the problems is, of course, this uh, massive transition of business wealth to the next generation. And how do you extrapolate that wealth <clears throat> so the business owner can can use it to support their lifestyles? And it's it's just silver tsunamis happening, as we all know. And so I'm just kind of thinking about how can it, us as financial advisors look look at our toolkit and um, make modifications or add to the toolkit to help these business owners. And my parents are business owners; they just sold their business. Um, I almost sold it one time. Um, that bridge is sailed. I'm happy to be an entrepreneur for the next 20 years, but but I went through the process. Um, and then, of course, I've seen business owners sell many of them. And the statistic is uh, is that 75% of business owners are upset or not or frustrated or disappointed after they sell. And mm -hmm. so I asked myself, how do we how do we help resolve some of that issue? And and it, and so I, I, I'm long winded when I, I answer the question. But one of the things that we've got to figure out is kind of getting business owners to sit down and just like be still grab them by the shoulders or her shoulders and say, I know you've got ADD, but I need you to sit down and ask what's life going to be like after you sell. Like, let's just think through this. Um, you can only play so much golf. You can only watch so much Fox news. You can only pick up, you know, plant so many flowers. Um, you know, what, what are you going to be doing with your time uh, that you don't drive your spouse nuts? And then of course we want to, Take your wisdom that you have, um, hopefully some money and time, and how can we reach down to the next generation and help them out? All that to say, we also have to make the math work. The economics have to work to where you don't outlive your money. You don't give the IRS too much money. So it really requires just a series of dialogues. And we created a business succession planning service to be able to facilitate, facilitate that conversations, but also 
make sure the pen, it pencils out well. Mm -hmm. So the key to good succession planning is is really to have a good vision of how you want to spend your time in retirement, and then how do you uh, balance tax optimization, perhaps, yeah. with the supporting next generation and your own needs and kind of how do you distribute the funds in an optimal way? Yeah. And even you, you know, you, you say it even better than me more succinctly, but the challenge is just whenever we say like, I've had people ask, what is the key to successful? It's really hard to get my head, like a simple answer to that, but it, it really is trying to match the cash flows with the vision. Um, and, and if I could say it succinctly is doing that. And then, so you ask, okay, okay, how do you, you don't even have a vision. So how do we, you know, let's get that vision in place, which is kind of Pollyannic qualitative, just, you know, foo -foo stuff. but I got to get, I got to, I actually got to know what you want to do and what your, your spouse wants to do. Cause those could be two different things. Um, getting that down and then saying, okay, does it pencil out? Um, how can we maybe pay the IRS less money? Do you want to leave an inheritance? Matching the vision with the cash flows is really the key to this whole thing. Mm -hmm. So how do you uh, actually coach these people? This is really coaching, right? Financial uh, coaching. You, you have to ask the question that will catalyze the right kind of thinking from your clients so that they actually you help them figure it out because i agree with you most people don't think about that what am i going to do they've been so wound up in their business the last 20 years working 160 hours a week uh, whatever and they had no time to pay attention to hardly anything else and now suddenly the business is gone uh, what am i going to do um, and how do I find equivalent meaning in my life going forward? So how do you, what kind of questions do you ask them? How do you get them see the light basically? Oh, uh, it's such a, it's such a really good question. So we have some tools that do that. Um, my favorite tool is one called honest conversations, mm -hmm. um, which was really adopted for the personal advice side. We use it a lot on the personal advice side, but it really works on the business side and it was developed, um, trying to think what university it was the university in California that did, did the academic research this kind of goes in that category of elegant too but it mm -hmm. it really um it really starts to ask questions about what's your priorities so it's a priority questionnaire um but a key piece to that is um is getting a this is really the the the, the most important piece to all of it is getting alignment with a spouse now mm -hmm. of course it's it's slightly different if they're single but but a lot of times there is a spouse involved and they've been so disconnected for so many years and they've put some coping mechanisms in place to make the thing work. But those coping mechanisms generally fail when the business is no longer there. And so what we like to do is just try to create some alignment with some of these questions that are uh, developed through the Honest Conversations tool. Honest Conversations tool was developed through a, an academic framework called behavioral finance, also rooted in Daniel Kahneman's work, Thinking Fast and Slow. And mm -hmm. so these key questions, uh, behavioral finance questions, um, just really organize people's thoughts behind what is important to them, prioritize it, match it with the spouses. And then we use that as our guiding post to go forward and execute our strategy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You could also do it. So we do it with priorities, but you, there's also tools that... Um, uh, create a dialogue around values. And so the key to having these um, outcomes, so it's not only key questions, but outcomes is when things start, you know, because life is so uncertain and things happen, whether it's a, it's a virus or a, or planes hit buildings or kids, grandkids issues. When things get rocky, I want to, what I want to try to do is uh, create anchors so we can go back and say and you do this all the time with in coaching if somebody has rockiness in their business you go back okay what's your mission what's your vision what's your values let's go to back that and let's our, ask ourselves how do we make decisions anchoring to those things business coaches do it excellent in business the problem is is when we lose the business and our business coaches we don't have those same anchors personally and so what I try to do and what our team tries to do is get the husband and wife to create these anchors again either priorities or values and go back to that so that way it could be our framework going forward when we hit those volatile times. This reminds me of the empty nesting syndrome that <laughs> uh, parents go through when their kids are out of the house and suddenly they don't have to 
um, transport them to sports practices and games at the weekend, and suddenly the calendar opens up. And now everything, every problem that you see under the carpet, now you have to deal with it, right? There's nowhere to hide anymore. And it sounds like this is similar to a family business. You know, the business takes up so much of the bandwidth that it can mask all the problems because there are always crises that take priority. So you don't have to deal with the big questions of life. And suddenly you remove that. And then, you know, the emperor is naked and now you have to figure things out. Um, 100%. For real. 100%. Yeah. Yeah. So so maybe it's better for some people not to set a business, not to transition so that they don't have to, to face the music, right? So uh, obviously, I know that's tongue in cheek. My my biggest challenge with that is, yeah, you could drive the business to the ground, but usually there's there's a consequence, a personal consequence. I, I always, you know, think about um, business owners and how even in my industry, so I'm in the financial advice industry. That's the business I'm in. It's a service. And I, and I see some of my peers that probably should retire. If their clients knew how much they just let their business kind of run, mm-hmm. um, you know, I think that's a little bit, there's a, there's an ethical issue there. So I think that's, you know, that's something that any good business person, their conscious needs to, they need to ask themselves is if they're not giving it their best. And that includes employees too. And so I think when there gets a point, I mean, certainly you can, you deserve it. You, you've, you've run the business. You can kind of let it kind of fade if you want. There's nothing wrong with that. As long as there's not neglect for those people that are counting on you. Yeah, it's a great point. It's a great point. So when, when is the point where uh, your uh, responsibility as a steward of your business is uh, more important than your perhaps the meaning that you derive from being that CEO of that business? And how do you, you know, how do you make that decision, that personal painful decision? That's that's really interesting. Dilemma. Maybe Maybe the C12 group, uh, you guys can really have a structure to deal with this kind of dilemmas. Maybe you go back to the Bible and you uh, you find some solutions there. Uh, well, you to- know, it's funny you mentioned that because in the Bible, they only reference retirement once. And retire by definition is, um, a Webster definition is the disposal of an asset when it's no, no longer useful. But in the Bible, in the Old Testament, um, God actually tells Moses and the Levites, he says, um, to retire, but, you know, I don't know the original Hebrew text, but it's really referring to, um, God's not telling them, Hey, stop working. It's just saying it's time for you to transition. And there could be assumptions on why, but it's really not clear. But I think the main thing, uh, to, to get at is, is there is that kind of inflection point. Like you can imagine, I can, you know, you probably chart this thing out where it's, you know, your body, your body it, 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 it's hurting you to stay there. Um, I've, I've had thousands of conversations with business owners and, and sometimes if you're there too long, it's killing you, your health. I mean, that's just one litmus test alone is when it's really hurting your back or your health and your emotions. And you, it's just time. But the, the problem with waiting until that is, is you might've hurt a, long, a lot of people on the way there. So it's better to get in front of that and, and leave on a high note. Um, but it really does, in terms of C12, going back to C12 and kind of the Christian point of view there, it does help having that peer group and saying, here's how I'm feeling, guys or girls. Tell me what y'all think. And and that's really that's really one of the benefits of a peer group like that. So I almost feel like uh, a 25, 30-minute podcast is not enough to solve life's great problems, such as retirement. So we're not going to try. Mm-hmm. But uh, I really enjoyed the conversation. It was very enlightening. Um I, I learned a little bit about C12 and uh, I think our listeners enjoyed it as well. So if people would like to learn more about uh, your, your firm, Pax Financial Group, and maybe they live in Texas and they need some help with their you know, transitioning their business, where can they reach out to you and how can they learn more about what you guys do? Yeah, thank you, Steve. Um, Pax Financial Group is a great way to go. Uh, it's a great place to go. That's uh, a lot of resources there linked to our podcast as well. It's called Retire in Texas um, podcast. Um, I just do that just as a solo talking about relevant um, thoughts on the markets. Uh, do one this week on taxes. LinkedIn is a good place to connect with me. A lot of people follow my contact and uh, on LinkedIn and I'll be sure to 
to share this um, uh, this broadcast with my community through LinkedIn as well. So those are three places, the website, podcast, and LinkedIn. Well, definitely, uh, if you uh, look to help um, with your transition, your retirement, or you would like to learn more about C12 or this whole idea of uh, as a Christian person, how you can uh, you know, uh, look for solutions and answers in the texture to your business problems, uh, then then definitely reach out to Daryl. Daryl, thanks for coming on the show. I really enjoyed having you. And uh, and those of you listening, uh, stay tuned. Follow us on YouTube, uh, Steve Preda uh, YouTube channel and the Steve Preda Business Growth LinkedIn page. Uh, and we're on TikTok as well. And you can watch the short versions of these videos that we record here. Thanks, Daryl. Have a great day. Thank you, Steve. Appreciate it.